Hello and welcome, my name is Meeples, she, they, and this is Literally Graphic. And today we are doing a couple of things. First off, we are going to take a quick look at another very short comic from the Graphic History Collective about May Day, because we suddenly find ourselves in May. This is basically me revisiting a review I wrote in 2018 because the library seems incapable of filling my hold this time around, and that review is now private. Then, to continue, I wanted to start something that I hope will become a yearly tradition and highlight some of the books I have reviewed in the past year that pertain to the struggles of the working class, as it were. I've loosely divided things into a straight labor struggle, anti-fascism, decolonization, prisons, immigration, gender and sexuality, economics, and international perspective. Obviously, most books could fall under more than one of these categories, but you probably know how much I like vague structure. I suspect that this video will be a bit long because I'm recapping on two and a half years, but there will be many flip throughs to look at, so it should be fun. Starting off doing justice to the month of May, I wanted to talk briefly about the very succinct May Day, a graphic history of protest put together by the Graphic History Collective and published by Between the Lines in 2012. Written from a so-called Canadian perspective, there is coverage of the rest of so-called North America, with some pretty effortless inclusions of contributions from not just men. This book also included some visual racial diversity that I thought could be pushed further. I continue to be disappointed by the lack of disability representation in labor history comics. Other books from the Graphic History Collective that I've reviewed so far are Direct Actions Get the Goods by the collective in collaboration with Althea Balms, Gord Hill, Oran Kurzetsi, and David Lester, and the 1919 Winnipeg General Strike, which I reviewed very recently. These in particular are geared towards use in the classroom. Other books that fall under labor struggle, although from a so-called North American perspective, include A People's History of American Empire by Howard Zinn. This is a graphic novel adaption of his book, A People's History of the United States. Both are needed antidotes to the anti-human history that I, at the very least, was taught in school. Masks of Anarchy, the history of a radical poem from Percy Shelley to the Triangle Factory Fire by Michael Dempson and Summer McClinton, a British exception that proves the rule that, minus the introduction, was a great example of how we can reframe history from the perspective of more marginalized genders. Similarly, Ginger Goodwin, A Worker's Friend by Laura Ellen, is not only a biography of the historical figure Ginger Goodwin, but also talks about the process of gathering history together to write nonfiction. And I know I've talked about this particular book many times, but I can't not bring up A Dangerous Woman, a graphic biography of Emma Goldman by Sharon Rudel, a biography of noted Russian-Jewish anarchist Emma Goldman. This could even serve as a good jumping off point to reading some of Goldman's own work. Moving right along, the next heading in my script is anti-fascism. Kicking off with my most recent review, I just made a bit video about a recently translated work, Primo Levi, by Matteo Mastrogostino and Alessandro Rengasi, a nonfiction piece which is about Levi telling school children about his time in Auschwitz. Next up, a book I don't bring up very often is Fight Fascism, an anthology slash magazine put together by WW3. And to conclude this section, Gord Hill's The Anti-Fascist Comic Book, which really digs into the history of anti-fascism. Moving along to decolonization, a part of left politics that cannot be talked about enough because my fellow livers on so-called North America have either had their land stolen or are living on stolen land. Starting off, I wanted to highlight Portraits of Violence, an illustrated history of Radical Critique, which is an anthology that includes selection of various philosophers, including Hannah Arndt, Franz Fanon, Jacques Derda, Edward Said, Paolo Ferrari, Michael Foucault, Susan Sontag, Noam Chomsky, Judith Butler, and Giorgio Agamben, published by Between the Lines. Moving along, aimed at young adults, Sugar Falls, a residential school story by David Alexander Robertson and Scott B. Henderson, is an important look into the experience of residential schools in so-called Canada. And to sound a bit like a broken record, I can't help but highlight another book by Gord Hill, 
the 500 Years of Resistance comic book, and I just saw on Instagram that apparently Arsenal Paul Press is going to be releasing a refreshed and expanded version of this comic book. So yay! Next up, we have Angola Jenga, Kingdom of Runaway Slaves by Marcelo de Salate and translated by Andrea Rosenberg. Quote, an independent kingdom of runaway slaves founded in the late 16th century, Angola Jenga was a beacon of freedom in a land plagued with oppression. And a recent five-star review that I did that's worth revisiting is Nat Turner by Kyle Baker, an insightful adaption of Nat Turner's own testimony about the slave rebellion he kicked off on August 21st, 1831 in Southampton County, Virginia. The final comic in this section is another anthology, this time focused on self-liberation. Maroon Comics Origins and Destinies was the book that introduced me to the existence of Maroons, which has altered my politics forever. Moving right along, we have Prisons. I wasn't sure if I would have enough comics for this section, but looking back at my reviews, I realized I had talked about a handful of comics about prisons. The most abolitionist comic is The Real Cost of Prison Comics, another short anthology work that, quote, provides a crash course in what drives mass incarceration, the human and community cost, and how to stop the numbers from going even higher, end quote. Next up, we have one of the few arcs that I have reviewed via Night Galley, Guantanamo Voices, True Accounts from the World's Most Infamous Prison, words by Sarah Merck with a collection of artists. Considering how many people appear to believe that Obama closed Guantanamo, this was a timely reminder at the end of the Trump administration. Then we have They Called Us Enemy, an autobiography co-written by George Takai and company that covers Takai's time as a child in World War II American concentration camps. Displacement covers the same time period with the author Kiku Hughes using the little she knew about her grandmother's time in the American internment camps to write a young adult historic fiction graphic novel. The use of those two terms was reflecting what words were used in each book's Goodreads description. The fifth category that I wanted to hone in on is the immigration slash emigration experience. My most recent review was Rendezvous in Phoenix by Tony Sandoval a memoir about the creator's choice to move from Mexico to the USA for love. But of course, one of the first graphic novels I really got into as an adult, and one that almost everyone who has read a graphic novel has probably at least thought about reading, we have Marjane Satrapi's memoir duology, Persepolis. I also highly recommend all y'all pick up her somewhat less popular nonfiction memoir work, Embroideries, which is a quote, gloriously entertaining and enlightening look into the sex lives of Iranian women, end quote. An interesting follow-up to that was Nylon Road, a graphic memoir of coming of age in Iran by Parsu Bashi. Category number six, I also wanted to highlight gender and sexuality. Never fear though, I'm not going to now highlight every book Book I've read for the A to Z of Queer Lit Project. The following are titles that I feel highlight leftist things and queer things. Fun! First off, I could not not talk about Gumballs by Aaron Nations, a trans memoir that dedicates a lot of time to showing how soul grinding customer service can be even in Portland. Next up, I felt like including The Complete Wendell, a comic strip from the 80s. It centers a lot of working class people surviving being queer during the Reagan Bush years in the so-called USA. As a relatively young queer, I appreciate the window into this recent history. And to conclude, I did want to point out some very good nonfiction guides. We have Gender, a graphic guide, which is a good way for anyone to dip their toe into an engaging overview of the history of gender in relation to the so-called USA. Similarly, the Quick and Easy Guide series touches on a couple of different topics. They, them pronouns, queer and trans identities, and consent in a very short and engaging comics that are very enlightening. The smallest category thus far, I promise I'm putting together a reading project for books highlighting the experience of people falling outside of able-bodiedness, but the one disability memoir series I wanted to highlight was Rocksteady, Brilliant Advice from My Bipolar Life, and Marbles, Mania, Depression, Michelangelo, and Me, both by Ellen Forney, which share the creator's story about first living undiagnosed with bipolar disorder and struggling with accessing treatment while not compromising their creative process. Second to last, I did think I would highlight books that showcase economic issues 
and ideas from a left perspective. And of course, to kick this category off, I couldn't start off with anything less than the Communist Manifesto, a graphic novel adapted by Martin Rousen. Pretty self-explanatory. Next up, I wanted to remind y'all of War in the Neighborhood by Seth Tabachman, a non-fiction comic about gentrification in New York City and squatter activism. And last, but certainly not least, we have Black Panther for Beginners by Herb Boyd and Lance Tooks. Not one of my more popular reviews, but I still think it's important. And the actually last category, International Points of View, holding myself accountable to reading diversely geographically. Starting off, it's been a minute since I last talked about Grass by Kim Suk Gendry Kim and translated by Janet Hong. Quote, Grass is a powerful anti-war graphic novel telling the life story of a Korean girl named Oksun Lee who was forced into sexual slavery for the Japanese Imperial Army during the Second World War, a disputed chapter in 20th century Asian history. Next up, I have to highlight a game for swallows, To Die, To Leave, To Return by Zena Abrakard and translated by Edward Gowan, which is a memoir about Abrakard's childhood during the civil war in Lebanon. A recent favorite was Other Russias by Victoria Lomasco and translated by Thomas Campbell. I really appreciated the look Lomasco gave us into working class concerns in Russia. And to wrap things up, I also recently finished Aya by Marguerite Abut and Clement Obrary. The series follows the lives of Aya and company as they make their way through life in 1978 Ivory Coast. And that's all they wrote. Thank you to anyone who stuck around to the end. Sorry I didn't dig deeper into each book. It just felt like this video was going to be long enough. I hope each of you found something new to pick up and check out. Bye y'all, keep reading, and resist white supremacy. And as always, Literally Graphic is created on land that should be given back to the traditional land holders which in this case is, to my knowledge, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, Anishinaabe people, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat Nation.